Hey guys, I'm Eddie Joe, and I'm very, very enthusiastic, as you can see, and I'm very excited to be talking about the Adrenal Trial, which came out today. Today is January 19th, 2018, and we've been waiting for this trial for many years now, and this is supposed to be the definitive end-all, be-all answer to whether to give patients uh, stress dose steroids and septic shock. It was published in New England Journal of Medicine, and um, the link is going to be below, and I'm definitely willing to have any type of academic conversation that you all may have just leave me comments down below and let's let's talk about this because this is academics and we discuss everything so the adrenal trial is adjunctive glucocorticoid therapy in patients with septic shock there are two other studies well actually there are numerous other studies that preceded this including the corticus uh, trial which was also in new england um that discuss the role of stress dose steroids in patients who are in septic shock and this this particular study is way larger than, than any, of, any of those studies. This particular study has 3,800 3, patients. That's a lot of patients who are in septic shock and mechanical ventilation. So I always tip my hat to the researchers because they did a phenomenal job. I'm not a researcher myself. So I just go through these articles and try to learn how to be best take care of my patients because of the information provided here. So let's go through it. The question that is being asked is whether hydrocortisone or stress dose steroids have a role in patients who are in septic shock. What they basically did to figure out if it worked or not is that they got, a, they got one group that got stress dose steroids at 200 milligrams of hydrocortisone IV and infusion over the course of seven days and a, and a group of patients that got the placebo for the same amount of time. And the researchers had no idea which group was which. The doctors didn't have either. There's some cool pictures of what the actual product looked like. Um, that's all very nerdy, but that's just what, things that I like. But um, they, they did a lot of the cool things to make sure that the people who were receiving the therapy, the people who were actually uh, ordering these drugs, all that, had no idea what was going on. And you can read more about that in the methods and all that. But what I'm here to talk about are the outcomes. First of all, the primary outcome, mortality, 90 days, no statistically significant difference. Was I expecting that? Yes, I was actually expecting that. It's so hard to see, you know, to find a statistically significant difference in mortality in, any, in anything we've ever done with septic shock, except for like Zygris, but we all know how that went. So, so all in all, um, I'm not surprised to see that there was no difference in mortality in the patients who receive stressful steroids versus not. But it's the secondary outcomes that are, that are the parts that fascinate me about these, this trial because these are things that myself as an ICU person, I want to make better in, this patient, in these patients. The one key point is that these people had a 30% mortality rate in patients who are in septic shock, which is, which is what one would expect based on all the mortality numbers of all the other studies that have been published recently with regards to septic shock. Secondary outcomes, 28-day mortality, no statistically significant difference in those patients. Shock resolution, this is a good one. Patients who received stress dose steroids had a statistically significant difference in the resolution of shock. They got over their shock faster. What does that mean? That they required less pressors. They required less pressors. They needed their central line for less time. Uh, you know, all the interventions that we do for patients who are in septic shock with regards to labs and all that, if you're no longer in septic shock, then you no longer need all those resources expended. So this is important. With regards to the recurrence of shock, you know, the patients who are on pressors are being treated for shock, then they get a little bit better, but then they go back into shock. There was no statistically significant difference in these patients. ICU stay, this is a big one. Why? Because being in the ICU costs a lot of money and a lot of resources. I cost a lot of money, my RTs, my nurses, my pharmacists, all these things cost a lot of money. But they were able to find that the patients who got stress dose steroids spent less time in the ICU than patients who got the placebo, which is amazing, amazing, amazing from a, from a financial standpoint. I mean, just think about the burden in the whole healthcare system. Hospital stay, no statistically significant difference. Duration of mechanical ventilation. Patients who got stress dose steroids had an average of six days. The patients who got placebo had seven days that they were on the ventilator as an average. This is extremely important because patients who are on the vent don't suffer. Like patients who are on the vent, excuse me, suffer way more than patients who are not on the vent. I mean, I would rather be extubated if I was in septic shock one day sooner and get the stress dose steroids and deal with the complications that I'm going to 
mentioned to you a little bit later on, but I would much rather prefer to be extubated uh, than to be on the ventilator, not to mention the cost of this. Being on the vent is extremely expensive, um, and all the sedation that goes with it, there, there's so many complexities to it, which stressful st steroids benefits. Now, patients who get extubated, their reintubation rates are not higher um, with, uh, with stress dose steroids. And this goes back to the notion of do, do stress dose steroids make your diaphragmatic muscles weaker? Just this, although this isn't something that's in, a, in the literature here, but that's something in the back of our minds. Another huge secondary outcome that, that, takes, that has a lot of clinical reference is bacteremia and fungemia. People, myself included at one point, used to think that giving patients stress dose steroids increased their chances of becoming bacteremic or having some sort of secondary infection. Now we have data to support that this is false. It was not statistically significant, okay? There was no difference between the two groups with regards to bacteremia and fungemia. Another secondary outcome of utmost importance is blood transfusions. I don't know if the researchers knew that this was coming or not, but they found that there was a statistically significant difference in the amount of blood transfused to the patients who uh, did not have stress dose steroids compared to those who did have stress dose steroids. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, a lot of cost and a lot of, blo a lot of blood products. Blood is a resource that's difficult to come by, especially in certain countries, etc. Uh, not the point of what I'm just saying, but if you think about it, Patients who are in refractory sepsis have a greater likelihood of receiving more, more volume. I mean, even though we check a bunch of things like a bedside echo, IVC, passive leg raise, all the things that we do for volume status, um, there's no perfect way to do volume status. And so a lot of clinicians just go ahead and give more IV fluids to make the numbers pretty, so to speak. So if you don't need to give patients that much fluid because their sepsis is resolving faster, which was one of the secondary outcomes I just mentioned, then they're not going to hemodilute and therefore they're not going to need more blood transfusions. I think that this is awesome. The other thing is that if somebody is out of septic shock sooner, we're not going to be doing all of our constant vampire blood work that we do so frequently in patients who are in septic shock. I mean, uh, there are certain cases where I might do Q4 hour, uh, if somebody has an A-line ABG, to be doing constant uh, vasopressor, not vasopressor titration, but uh, ventilator titration. Or, you know, if you're doing Q6 hour um, BMPs with mag and phos, make sure your, your electrolytes are fine. If you have to do less of these tests, you're going to be taking out less blood from these patients, and therefore they're going to need less blood transfusions. This is, this is amazing stuff. It's super exciting. Lastly, with regards to renal replacement therapy, there was no statistically significant difference between the placebo group and the stress dose steroid group with regards to needing dialysis. Now, there are some things that bother me about this particular study, and I'm going to show this uh, particular graph right now, which is about the time intervals from when the people actually were randomized to the time where people actually got the stress dose steroids, because I think this is a little bit long. Per this graph that came from the presentation that they, that they did online, and thanks a lot to Rob from Critical Care Reviews for actually you know, getting this uh, particular video up on YouTube, but they talk about the, the time from ICU admission to randomization. And that particular time from ICU admission to randomized was 26.1 hours in the stress dose steroid group. That's a long time, that's a day. I usually don't wait a whole day before I decide to start stress dose steroids on a patient. In the placebo group, it was 29 hours. I think that that's a long time. These patients were started on pressors for about 20 hours, 21 hours, before they were actually randomized, and this was an average, of course. And then, once these patients were randomized, from the time that they were randomized so they got the actual drug was over an hour, 85 minutes, excuse me, 84.5 minutes and, and about 80 minutes, respectively, between the stressful steroids and the placebo. I think that this is, you know, this, I think that this is a very long period of time in the, in the scheme of septic shock before somebody is uh, able to get stress dose steroids. I don't know how you do it in your practice, but in my particular practice, if somebody's in septic shock and their pressors are climbing, you know, once they start hitting 12 to 15 of norepinephrine, I'm putting in orders right away for vasopressin. I'm also putting in orders for stress dose steroids. You know, that's granted. They've already been adequately volume resuscitated. They've gotten their antibiotics, cultures, all that, you know, all that jazz that, that at this, you know, if you're in the level where you're thinking about these trials, you already know all that stuff because you gotta, you know, build on that city. And then to further support my point, there's a particular table, which I'm going to also possibly put here right now, that shows the time of onset of shock to randomization. And they noted that the patients who uh, got randomized between 6 to less than 12 hours, they had a statistically significant improvement in their odds ratio um, compared, to, compared to 
the group that got the placebo. So in other words, the patients who got stressed on steroids did better than the placebo from a statistically significant margin. Now, one of the other things that was described was the adverse effects. And there were more adverse effects in the patients who got stressed on steroids compared to those patients who got um, just a placebo. And the two major, the two major um, adverse effects that are described are number one, hyperglycemia. Okay, well, you give that patient insulin and uh, you take care of that. Not a big deal, at least not in my opinion. I mean, if you're in an ICU that has a capacity to do this, you're, you have the capacity to dose the patient with some insulin. And the other thing is hypernatremia. And one of the things that's not discussed in this particular study are, um, are the, the amount of IV fluids that the patients got for resuscitation, because I always think that that's cool. I love resuscitation, I love IV fluids, so why not? And then the other thing that's not discussed in this in this particular uh, in this particular study was the type of IV fluids that was given. So if somebody got primarily resuscitated with uh, 0.9% sodium chloride, aka normal saline, then of course they're going to become more hypernatremic, you know, in any type of group, but more so in patients who got stressed on steroids. But once again, these patients, amongst the adverse effects. Infections like super infections with uh, more bacteremia and fungemia that did not that that did not exist in a statistically significant manner. So let me go back and summarize everything again, just to give you everything in a nutshell. My thoughts on the particular study and what the what the study is, and and as I mentioned, what are my changes in, the changes in my practice. First of all, 90 day mortality, no difference. Second, patients who got stressed with steroids had a rapid or more rapid improvement in their shock. They spent less days in the ICU, they spent less days on the ventilator, those are big things, and they got less blood transfusions. Those are all very big things to me and very important. And these, these are the reasons why I particularly like this study and why I think that it's a positive study, even though when you read the conclusions, that's why you should never be one of these people who just reads the conclusions. You gotta just analyze the study for yourself. The other things that it did not show though was a recurrence of shock, no difference, uh, reintubations, no difference, need for CRRT, no difference. Another big positive is the no difference in, uh, in uh, bacteremia and fungemia. So that's another good thing. So how does this change my practice? Well, before I say about how it's going to change my practice, I'm going to talk about what my practice currently is. And that's um, if, I, if I have a patient who's in septic shock and I go ahead and I resuscitate and give them their fluids or antibiotics and I do all my measurements to try to figure out what the optimal volume status is, uh, including bedside echo, IVC, all my goodies, um, then I titrate up the levofed, shooting for a particular map, depending on the depending on the patient, but it's usually 65. And then once I go ahead and I achieve all that, and the the pressure just keeps on climbing. Once I start going over uh, 12 to 15 mics per per kilogram per hour of levofed, I go ahead and I just put in the order for vasopressin as well as trastose steroids. How does it change with this article? It does not. Same thing, I also don't check a cortisol level and I also don't uh, do the stim test. Um, if a patient is this sick, I'm throwing in the kitchen sink. And that's how my practice is and that's how my practice is gonna continue being until I read more about all this. And um, yeah, that's basically my take on the, on the adrenal trial. Once again, thank you very much for all the researchers. Hopefully this benefits you in some way, shape or form and you get to learn a little bit. Always read, reading is cool, reading is fun. See you guys, thanks, bye.